Welcome. Welcome to our discussion today on reimagining the future of work, organized by the Boston Consulting Group and hosted by the Delphi Economic Forum. I am Marily Mexi, and I'm joined today by Debbie Lovitz, uh, Managing Director and Senior Partner in the Boston office of the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Ms. Lovitz is also Global Lead of BCG's People's Strategy Topic. She co-leads BCG's Build, Operate, Transfer Offering, and recently BCG's efforts on the future of work. So here we are. She's joining us from <laughs> Boston. I'm joining from Geneva, Switzerland. The event is being hosted by the Delphi people in Athens. So quite a global setting, I would say, Ms. Lovitz. Welcome. So nice to have you with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be part of this. Okay, our discussion will last 20 minutes, so I'm going directly to my first question, uh, just to set a little bit the background of our discussion. So, um, you know, before the pandemic, there were big discussions about how the future of work is changing and how uh, automation and digitalization are disrupting systems, norms, and people. And now with the pandemic, we all came to realize that things have changed, that notions like work, location, and time have become very fluid, very flexible, and very hybrid, I would say. So we are now in year two of the pandemic and in year two mm -hmm. of hybrid work. What lessons have we learned? What is your take on all these developments? Um, you know, I think the, the lessons are manifold, manifold. There is so much we've learned this past year. And I believe in my heart that, you know, after these years of the pandemic, people will look back at how we worked before COVID and think it's silly, right? You used to drive, you know, in traffic or take the train or the bus or fly, you know, to work, sit at a table, you know, in a cubicle and then, you know, go home. That will seem silly, right? And the fact that we get all our work done by meetings will seem silly. And, you know, what COVID has taught us is that um, there are many ways that we could get the work done, many ways, not just location, but as you said, also time, the notion of asynchronous collaboration, reducing face time, um, and also more flexibility uh, to give people the opportunity to fit their work around their lives instead of their lives around work. Um, so a lot of lessons to mine, for sure. Um. We have some studies, some surveys showing that after the pandemic, a great number of employees would like to continue to work from home, either entirely or partially. Um, in your view, and based on the evidence you have so far, uh, you, do you think that uh, hybrid work is the, actually the new normal? I do. I do think it's the new normal, but I want people to be really careful uh, when they think about hybrid work, because hybrid interactions are really hard. And so we need to be careful that hybrid work is, you know, teams decide together what days are they in the office, what days are they work from anywhere, right? And so we really have to work hard to develop hybrid norms that make it effective and don't go back. Um, the other thing about hybrid work and remote work for that matter is we can't simply replace what we used to do in the office online, right? We have to think about, all right, how do we connect socially through a camera? 
right? How do I reach inside the room and ask you, I love that painting behind you. Can you tell me about it? It's gorgeous, right? How do you socially connect? Um, how do you coach people remotely? And in fact, there are ways to coach that are even more effective because in the middle of meeting, I could send you a quick private note. That was a great comment, but I want you to do this next time the point comes up, right? We could coach live in ways that you couldn't in a live room, but we have to be intentional about it, right? We have to say, okay, to make hybrid really work well, what are the practices we need, like norms, like upskilling managers, um, you know, and how do we train people and really build the muscle to do it? Uh, so you, you, you are saying actually that this has to do with collaboration and we need to actually redefine our norms of collaboration and our practices, right? Completely Absolutely. from Chicago. And I read um, one. Well, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I read a, I an article in, in Forbes. You, you wrote about uh, hybrid work that it's time to hurry up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here's my fear. Here's my fear. My fear is, is, you know, we will go backwards instead of forwards right? Especially with senior leaders. Senior leaders um, are so used to working in person, right? That's how they grew up. It's how they operate. And if we want to take advantage of hybrid work and the benefits of hybrid work, because it's not just flexibility, it's also productivity. We saw great productivity. Um, it, you know, also engagement goes up, right? You know, your customers have gone online. So, you know, that's a way to interact with them. So if we want to take advantage of that, we need to make it okay for people to work from home. And so my fear is, is that your leadership and they have large offices <laughs> um, that are very nice to work from. But if the rest of the organization is going in, um, they will copy that and the hybrid benefits will start to go away. And so the hurry up point is, you know, hopefully the vaccine will get out globally. But so we have to, you know, I said we have to really think hard about how do we make hybrid work, hybrid work work. And we've got to do that before people just go back to the old ways and the old muscle memory will kick in. Mm -hmm. Um. For sure, with regard to, to hybrid work, there are certain advantages and disadvantages for uh, employers and employees alike. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is how to, to, uh, to, to ensure and maintain a healthy work-life balance um, in conditions of hybrid work. And uh, you have been actually the brain behind the very successful PTO program uh, at BCG. The aim of which was actually to improve work-life balance internally. Would you like to make some connections between the things you have achieved and the, th the challenges of the new era, the post-pandemic uh, period? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, one of the things, the program I introduced at BCG, gosh, it's like 15 years ago already. Uh, one of the things that that program taught us, again, that we have to, um, talk at a team level to create working norms. So that was one lesson, right? What like have open, honest conversations about the work, about life, about, you know, how do we communicate? Right now during COVID, we're on SMS, phone, email, Slack, in meeting chat, right? Let's align on how we communicate. So one thing we learned is about team norms, right? The second thing, um, we learned is about the importance of building a muscle to completely turn off and know the world won't fall apart. So one of the downsides of remote work is Zoom after Zoom after Zoom after Zoom. And if you work globally, like many of us do, I mean, you can work 24 hours a day. And so we have to, pull, again, build the muscle to put breaks in the day, breaks in the day. So one of the norms should be not just about when are we in the office and when we're not in the office, one of the norms team should decide, okay, when are we all on? So if we ever need to collaborate, even on remote days, when are we all online? So we could talk to each other, Slack with each other, you know, jump into a, a virtual team room together. Um, and then when are we off? You know, when are, and that's what we put in place with that program, times that you could just turn off, 
and you got to build that muscle to learn to stop, you know, checking this and know the world um, won't won't fall apart. Um, you know, it may be interesting to just share some um, um, perspective that, you know, I've spoken with hundreds of companies and worked with dozens of them you know, over the past year. And one approach we have to figuring it out, I'll talk through how we're um, thinking about what organizations need to do to make hybrid work work. Um, the first is to align on what is it that we're solving for? What is our priority with hybrid work? Is it employee engagement? Is it, um, you know, cutting costs from real estate? Is it productivity to maintain the productivity we saw during the pandemic year? Is it to innovate faster, right? So, and of course it's all of that, but a leadership team needs to prioritize what's the most important thing? What are we solving for when we're moving to hybrid work? The second is to align as a leadership team on the design principles or guardrails, right? And design principles can be things like, um, creating a level playing field, keeping the democracy that COVID created when everyone's in a meeting, right? You could see everyone the same, anyone could raise their hand. If they're not comfortable speaking, they could put it in the chat and, and it removed this unevenness that was before COVID when one person dialed in, they couldn't get a word in edgewise. And so one guardrail could be, you know, if one person's on the screen, everyone's on the screen. You know, a guardrail could also be we need consistency between functions. So if a call center in one part of the organization is allowed to work from home, that means call centers in every part of the organization. A design principle could be, you know, we believe in being together. So we have to at least half the time, you know, be all together. Right. So the leadership team should align on, you know, first what they're solving for. And then second, these design principles or guardrails for hybrid work. The third, um, and this is a bit of the work here, is to develop um, you know, different personas because it's hard to say, okay, every different job, we're good, every different role, every different country, we're gonna come up with what's the right mix of flexible work, both in terms of time as well as place. Um, so it's good to come up with personas, different types of arrangements. You know, one could be, you know, one input to that is the nature of the work itself. Is it collaborative or individual? Is it creative? Is it automated? Right. And more collaborative and creative work will tend to require more time in, on site. So one input is the work of the work. The other input are, you know, people and their preferences. And one of the things we see from our research is as many people want to be remote and flexible as they want to be in the office. And so we have to solve for a diversity of our people's needs. Um, and we also have to recognize, by the way, on remote days, not everyone has a home they could work from, right? They may not have the right setup. They may have too many roommates. They may be the 40% of, at least in our research tells us that 40% of LGBTQ employees are not out at work. And so they may not want you know, their life in the background. So we have to provide, even on remote days, places people can work. So almost like we work, like facilities, and turning your office spaces um, into places they could come in, but they could be on screen in an individual office. Um, so those are things, um, and then finally also where the customer's gone. Um, because if you want to go back to meet with your customer, but your customer has moved to an, you know, an e-commerce channel, um, you have to rethink the work, right? So those are inputs into the persona. And it's a bit work to do, um, but it definitely helps give guardrails, um, not just about you know, things like a level playing field or cybersecurity, but guardrails for types of jobs to teams. Um, so those are the first three steps. The fourth and the fifth um, are really some of the learnings from my past work changing how we work at BCG is allowing teams at the team level to create norms for how they work. I spoke about this earlier. This is what days are we on site? Uh, what times are we all online? What um, um, electronic medium are we using to collaborate, right? There are so many different tools we could use as a team. Where are we digitally hanging out and how are we talking to each other? 
um, you know, norms for what meetings are on camera versus off camera. I think with all this Zoom, we've lost the art of just a phone call without being on camera. And so we could bring that back. So those are examples of team norms. Um, and one really important message is we don't know the answer to how to make hybrid work work. I mean, even with my list here, this is new for the world. And that's where the fifth step comes in and is incredibly important, that we have to recognize that this is all new, right? We have to create a learning ecosystem to pulse check the teams, to collect data, to measure engagement, to measure innovation, to measure productivity, to see how is it working and mine the learnings and change. And so that learning ecosystem you know, will create a dynamic between number two and number four on this page because the teams will set up norms and then at the end of the week, they should spend some time to say what worked and what didn't, what should we change for next week? And as you learn what works for the teams, we could then feed that into revising design principles and guardrails. And that's a way to make this work truly experimental. Uh, I think this, this is quite a new world, I think. Uh, the future of work is quite new, uh, the way we are describing it. Uh, for sure, this um, implies that the role of the employer gets redefined, I think, from scratch. Uh, yeah. And usually we talk about the impact of the pandemic on, the, on workers and, and employees. But, and often the, the, the problems that the employers um, are, 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 have to, to, to tackle are, are of, you know, they are often uh, overlooked. So I would like to focus as our last, last question on the role of the employer. Um, how do you see things evolving? Is anyone being left behind? Are employers able to adjust sufficiently to the new normal? I think so. So I'm an optimist, I'll tell you. But we saw wonderful things, right, at the beginning of COVID. Employers adapted at speed and, and at scale, right? And we moved to do things that I think are changing the nature of the relationship between employers and employees, right? On wellness, we focused on making sure our employees are safe and got home. Um, child care, so many employers stepped up um and provided child care i have actually a column coming out in forbes um next week about the role employers are taking around wellness and new benefits um employers engaged on mental well-being this has been a really tough year mentally and physically and employers have really stepped up their role um that has to continue there's no going back the other way employers i think have changed is treating talent more fluidly, right? Mm -hmm. Banks took employees in the, from the retail banks that closed and put them in call centers. Insurance companies took employees that were dealing with vision and dental claims, because none of that was going on, and moved them into healthcare claims because so much mm -hmm. of that was going on. And even we saw in China, companies moved capacity from company to another company to help out. Mm -hmm. And so talent became okay. more liquid. Global crowdsourcing. I don't know if this uh, <laughs> yeah, companies now more, need to redefine their business uh, models to to respond to to new trends. Exactly, and and I think you know the good companies and organizations and leadership teams will not just say, okay, that was just for the pandemic, but they'll say mm -hmm. that was. By moving employees around, they learned more, they developed more, it broke down silos and organizations, and it helped us manage cost and capacity, right? How do we keep it? How do we keep it? Like imagine instead of having a job and a career ladder, right? Yes. You went into a staffing pool, you got put on a project or in a role for a while, and then you went back in the staffing pool. Then your career is more like, you know, a jungle gym than a ladder straight up. Um, and so I think employers showed incredible flexibility and mm -hmm. they should capture it and lean into it even further. But they should also be supported somehow. What do you think? I mean, uh, given some, uh, some, some, some incentives to, to, to be able to, to implement all this new, uh, new, uh, new potential, I mean, to put it in practice. Yeah, I yeah, I think well, 
I think the incentives um, to put in those benefits and, you know, treat talent more flexibly and join consortiums, like I think the benefit of that will be you will become a talent magnet, right? Mm -hmm. You will Thank get you. the best talent especially in a hybrid world, you could attract better talent. Um, you will drive engagement and engagement drives productivity, as we all know, um, and retention. And you'll manage your costs better because you will move your workers to where they're needed, right? And in consortium, you will work with companies instead of having to build it yourself, you could tap into talent in a more variable cost way. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's pretty exciting if organizations take that leap. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, time is up. Unfortunately, we have to finish here. It's been a very, it's been a short discussion, but very comprehensive and constructive one in many different ways. Thank you so much for your energy, your ideas, your enthusiasm. Thank you also to, a big thank you to, to the Delta Economic Forum and to the Boston uh, Consulting Group. And of course, a big thank you to our viewers watching us online. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.